My name is uh, Randy Newman. I'm a solutions architect with ZP Systems. So let me directly start uh, by just defining briefly the problem again, which we see at the, uh, at the edge with our customers. With the edge, I mean, it can be anything from a small store, shop, to an industrial setting where you have maybe just a rack with a couple of uh, pieces of equipment to, to any other locations. Uh, we have actually quite a lot of different customers in different settings, but they all have more or less a similar challenge that they have a large amount of devices with all different connectivity options. Some might use standard serial connections, some have USB uh, serial connections, others use a web interface, for example. Others have, because it's a server, they have some form of an IPMI or Redfish interface to, to good old KVM keyboard video mouse uh, interface where you just need to plug in a dongle on the one side. And on the other side, they might have a couple of different sensors. They might have a couple of different IoT devices. And all of these need to be managed to all of the, uh, those devices. They need to provide some form of a management access, management control uh, to them. Now, because those are remote locations, they have them different components to provide those kinds of connectivity. They might have an LTE connection, they, have, they might have a VDSL cable connection. We even still have customers with a good old PSDN connection. So you have all of those technologies which need to be uh, fit together. And then on top of that, you want to provide a secure connection, typically in form, uh, some shape or form of a VPN or anything like it. And then if you want to go higher up the stack, then you want to run additional services um, like some form of security, some form of uh, logging, or maybe you even want to go into the self-healing aspect of it. So overall, different, many different building blocks. And what most customers find is that most of these building blocks are available in some shape or form, but they're available from different vendors. There's hardly any overlap. Some vendors might provide some pieces, others others, and then they have to build the entire solution together. And sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't, and it's 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 a little bit of a puzzle piece. So, and that is exactly where we are coming in. That is the problem which we're trying to solve. We're trying to um, simplify that stack. Um, so, Briefly coming then to the really to the presentation today, what we're going to look at is, is a typical branch location. So you as you would probably identify with, with that uh, picture here, the most edge or branch locations on the left hand side, you have your, your branch network with all the different components there, a couple of security cameras, sensors, end users, maybe you have your routers, your switches, whatever equipment you might have in that location. Then you're going to have some form of a gateway. Uh, most of current customers use some form of an SD-WAN solution, which is typically sitting on a hardware box. Uh, you might have a cable modem, 5G connection, whatever you have in that, in that environment. Maybe you even have a, a satellite arm link. Uh, and then you use those connections using a secure tunnel to pipe your traffic either directly to the cloud or to your to your data center, whatever you might have. So what that solution uh, or what that picture is pretty much giving you though is as long as your gateway is up and running, you can access your devices, you can provide you can provide management access to them, you can uh, perform maintenance tasks. The big question really becomes okay, what happens if that gateway becomes unavailable for whatever reason? Uh, might be completely outside of your control. So that is where we are providing our solution with our node grid uh, platform. Um, as you can see, the bottom part is exactly the same as it was before. So we are not really changing the layout. We're not really changing the design of how you deploy your branch offices, but we are providing a fully dedicated out of band layer, which sits in parallel to your office. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to deploy 50 different appliances or 50 different uh, hardware components. It just means that you are deploying one of our solutions in your branch office. And that one box can provide all the necessary management connectivity to all of the devices you have in your, in your branch. So specifically here, we're looking at the Bordis R. The Bordis R has a combination of 
network interfaces, standard uh, one gig interfaces, has a combination of serial ports, has a combination of USB ports, and all of those together can be used to connect to any typical management interface as well. Um, probably worthwhile mentioning that both is R, specifically the one which we have in our demo, is a wireless interface as well, a Wi-Fi interface. So you can even use it as a Wi-Fi client if you wanted to, to investigate how your connectivity is to your Wi-Fi access point, which you might have in location. The boat is R, downstream connects to your management interfaces, upstream or to the right-hand side connects to our ZP cloud in, uh, system which provides out-of-band access, which provides central management to all of your sites and simplifies the deployment and management of those sites. Okay. So to put a better picture around it is in the next slide, um, as Kurush already mentioned, we have one rack currently in our head, uh, head office uh, where Naldo is sitting, that is on the West Coast. I'm German living in Ireland, so a couple of thousand miles away. And what I'm going to show you really is how I use our ZP cloud to connect to that rack and perform certain, uh, certain activities on it. Specifically for this demo, we are focusing on three different components. Uh, we are going to focus on our node grid platform, the node grid board is R with a wide range of connectivity to sensors, accurators, and other management interfaces. We are going to look as well at uh, the central management component, our ZP Cloud, how you can use it to push configurations, to perform backups, to perform standard management tasks. And then lastly, we're going to look at um, the NodeGrid Data Lake application. Essentially, our ZP Cloud platform is extendable. We are have already a couple of applications there. The Data Lake app is one specific one which we have um, released to our customers. And that allows you to collect data from your sensors, from your end devices, from probes which you're deploying onto the NodeGrid platform, collect them in our cloud, and then use those data for analysis and uh, analytics. So what you're, what you're seeing right now is our ZP Cloud uh, login page. Let me just briefly log in. We have, um, overall, we have two ZP Cloud instances globally. We have uh, the, our main instance, which we're using here, which is hosted in the US. And then for our European customers, we have a dedicated instance sitting in Europe. And the first time you log in, you will, you're presented to the roadmap where you see all of your different sites. You see the current status of the site. Green is good and healthy. And then we have um, a partial available state and an offline state as well. So we can directly report from here in what state the, the site is in. Um, by just clicking on the site, I'm getting down to drill down to that specific site. And from here, I can directly start a session. I'm going to do that in a minute. First, I just want to show you a little bit more about what, you, what kind of data you can see in our cloud instance. So for right now, you can directly see the host name of the board is R, which is in our data center, its serial number, its current status, and so on and so forth. By clicking on the name, you can get more information about it. You can see firmware version uptime and a couple of other informations. Probably the most interesting one is for ATE customers, you can see the current data consumption historically, how much data you have used, and what um, and specifically when those data was accumulated over time. So all of that information is already available directly from, from our cloud for, for reporting purposes. One thing which is probably noteworthy here is you see two SIMs. Essentially all of our devices support at least two modems with two active SIM connections. So if you have two available, then the second part would be filled out here as well. You have to have multiple Renee. cards or do you have dual SIM support on a single card? So each modem can take two SIMs, which is an inactive passive setup. So one active SIM with, uh, with, a, with a failover to a second SIM. If you have a second modem in it, then you can have two active connections at the same time. So who, who's responsible for the SIMs? Is that customer? Do you guys do it? 
So currently, mostly our customers are looking after the SIMs, which they're providing. We have um, a global support with different carriers in the US, um, and I can maybe have, but we have AT&T, Verizon, uh, and Telecom in the US, which where we are officially certified, and then the modems are globally certified. So we have customers deploying the, our units on a global scale with global providers. No, we also have an option to provide this, the SIM card, right, uh, along with the box. So we have that with um, uh, Verizon, and we are extending this with AT&T. Here in North America, is we support AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. Uh, but we have um, started with uh, Verizon first uh, and then expanding to other carriers where we just um, add the, the SIM card and then the customer can activate the SIM card. Uh, so then it doesn't need to go through the trouble of procuring the car. Is it only physical SIMs or do you support eSIM? eSIM as well on the uh, newer modules that are 5G. Um, so we've introduced 5G and uh, the 5G would have the eSIM option as well. So this is uh, one of the cards that are as modular uh, for the NS, uh, the Net SR. Uh, it, the, with one modem, you get the two SIM cards and you can actually put two of these in the modular version. And then the, the one that's more uh, built in, and I can actually even open this one up uh, to show you. So this one, I don't know if you're gonna, on camera you can see, but um, it has four SIM cards and dual modems uh, inside. Fanless device as well, pretty ruggedized DC powered so for harsh environments applications. So on that note in the harsh environments, I'm curious, are you guys, uh, are you guys looking at things like CBRS for private LTE networks to be able to support that? I know in the mining, manufacturing and energy spaces, we're seeing more and more private LTE networks deployed for hard to reach areas. Is that on your radar? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, we've been asked for the first net modem uh, support, right? So which, uh, which is a, just a different uh, modem that we can plug in. CBRS uh, uh, has more of a software element uh, to it as well. Um, so we have, uh, we've been asked for CBRS, but we, we are exploring that area right now. If there are any projects, happy to uh, talk through it. The cool part about having a flexible platform is as, you know, as long as the technology allows and, uh, you know, Linux is your friend, uh, we can certainly yes, say yes to many of these projects. So from, from here on, I'm just going to directly then uh, connect directly to the device and then show you a couple of things on the device. So for that, you can just click on the web button. Um, let me briefly switch back to highlight briefly. So you have a web button here, which just brings you directly to the web interface of our device. You can directly, if you're more a console guy, you can directly start a console session as well or from down here, you can directly connect to any of the connected target devices as well. So all of that is directly available. For the demonstration, I'm just uh, directly going to uh, to the web interface. Uh, One thing I which I want to pull. Yeah. This is Aaron Conway. Can you, can you go back to the previous slide there? Of course. Yeah. Like, um, you had the web and console, but like I'm looking at the APC PDE right there has web and console. Is that web connection directly to the device or is it proxy through? The cloud service here. So let me actually show you that directly in the in on the product. But very very good question. So in general, we are acting like a terminal server, meaning we are doing the the node grid boat is R here, and it's the communication from the boat to the end device, and then we proxy the information through to the uh, to the user. That is true even if you're directly going to one of our devices independent of the cloud. If you use a cloud, then we start the connection to the board, board passes it on to the cloud, and then it gets proxied onto you. Okay, so it's a very important point because it means none of the devices you have in your remote branch, you need, there's no need to have direct network access to it. Okay, they don't even need to have an internet gateway or an internet router available. All what they need to be able to is to talk to the board is R, which is on your side. Yeah, there, there are two, two aspects here, right? The network separation, right? Um, so the network isolation for security, but we provide you access to that. And the second thing is the authentication, right? Yeah. Um, the authentication is also separate, right? Even it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that it, because you have cloud, you're gonna have direct access to the devices. You still need to authenticate to the devices. Of course, we support uh, dual octa ping identity and all the other 
single sign-ons, right? But this is another level of security that network separation and that of password enforcement, right? It's all present. Given the, in the experience that we have, right, fulfilling products uh, to the data center, to these very um, bleeding edge tech companies that require a lot of uh, security from us. Then let me show you briefly a couple of those target connections. It probably says more than, than, than a thousand words. So as soon as you're logged in, you have, uh, you get presented again, very similar to an access screen from where you can start those console sessions. As I mentioned before, you can directly start them from the cloud as well. You don't need to log in locally to the, to the box. I just find that view a little bit more um, easy to read um, and easy to explain. So as, I meant, uh, as we had mentioned before, we have a couple of sensors. You can, you can see here the sensors. If I go to my temperature and humidity sensor, for example, I can see that it's current readings, uh, temperature reading, humidity reading. But same is true for any of the other sensors, uh, like we have a relay RFID reader, uh, we have a GPIO, and we have as well signal towers, which are, which are a siren and, and a visual alarm. We have actually a camera pointing at the rack. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. If you can, great. I'm just going to show you. I'm going to turn on one of the lights and I can, I can scare the hell out of everybody by just turning on the alarm as well. Um, so essentially, those kinds of sensors are fully supported by us. They are provided by us. Uh, but if you want to use this, uh, there you can even hear it. Let me turn it back off. <laughs> um, but if you want to use your own sensors, um, then we fully support that as well. What is probably uh, interesting about those sensors is you can use them in your own uh, form of automation and uh, alerting, event management, and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of what you can do with the sensors and we're going to revisit them with our data lake where we are pulling the information and then use them for, uh, for analytics to give you visibility in your, the environmental statuses of your, of your remote site. Now, besides of that, what we have on the operational IT side as well is, we already mentioned that direct PDU. In this case, it is from, from APC, from Schneider. When you click on the device, you can get the outlet status. I can control the outlet from here. What is probably interesting to, uh, to mention here is why you can do it directly from the REC PDU. You can assign those outlets to target devices as well. And then you have the control based on the target device. Um, here's, a, here's a good example. That is a, it's a server which we have in that rack and I know outlet three is connected to that server. So I just need to know, okay, I want to connect to that server. And then from here I can do it directly the power control. I have the same options as well when I open up a session, console session. So in this case, it's a standard serial connection using RG45 uh, connection, but you can use the same thing as well using USB, um, a USB serial console, which gets more and more common as well. On the power, so on power, you know, giving power access to everybody in the team could be a real bad day for everybody. How do you sort out the uh, access levels for the different levels of IT staff that you're going to have so that I don't have a, you know, somebody that's maybe very, very junior um, that has access to the, you know, power controls for the, you know, core switches in the data center or something like that. What is, how does that work? So we have, we have role-based authentication uh, mechanisms, essentially. So what you do is you set up different roles, different groups, and you can assign different target devices to those groups. And then on each target device, you can as well define what they can do. So you can give one group only console access. You can give another group uh, console access and power control, for example. So now, would it be possible, is, uh, sorry, would it be possible, for example, to give somebody the status of power, but not the ability to control power? Yes. Yes. You can do okay. read only as well. Correct. Great. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, so all, 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 all of that is, is bit in. Sorry. Uh, just to piggyback on off of that question real quick, um, do you have the uh, the ability to support that with um, like Active Directory services or or other centralized uh, identity services, either yes. on-prem or cloud? So we are fully supporting all your standard authentication providers. Let me show you actually on the security. 
and then authentication, you would just click on add here and then you would add your authentication provider. So standard add up Active Directory in all the different shapes and forms, mm -hmm. Raiders, TACAX, Cabras, that are the normal ones. And then we support single sign on using SAML2, which is in your Okta, Duo, Ping ID, um, okay. all of those. Two factor here is uh, we are officially certified with RSA as well. So if you have, if you want to use RSA tokens as a second second factor, then that is fully supported as well. Do you, yeah. do you have fallback if say SSO isn't working? Yes. So any of these authentication providers, essentially, let me show you briefly again the interface as well. There's one option here called, uh, called fallback if denied access. That means we have a waterfall mechanism. The very first one takes precedence and then if that option is set and that is that server isn't available or the user isn't doesn't exist in that uh, method, then it will fall down to the next one, down to the local one, which is in the very last instance. Yeah. So and there's again, there's no limit actually to how many authentication providers you can have. You can have five, six, seven different authentication providers if you wanted to. So uh, where were we? Oh, so CEO console. I showed you that. Um, show. I'm just going to uh, get here a little bit uh, briefer. Last one, which I really want to show you then is maybe just a web session. And probably with web sessions, it's far more important that we have that network separation. Uh, a good example here is, uh, is Meraki. The, um, you prob most of you probably have already worked with Meraki. They have a local status page and that is only available on the local network that is not routed through, right? So that specific, is R has an internal connection to a market device and uh, we can bring up that status page to you. Uh, you can then even log in and you can do all the local configuration changes if you if it needs be. So if that Meraki for whatever reason is disconnected from the cloud, um, you can just come in through the board, open up the web interface, see what the current status is locally, and then if needs be do uh, perform some basic configuration changes uh, whatever the mark is allowing you to do. Yeah, this this okay. was a popular ask uh, to give that virtual presence, you know, virtual remote hands, and uh, you know, with Meraki being uh, out there in a lot of the retail establishments and their success, they've also generated a lot of problems for people. So that's one of the reasons that um, we get pulled into a lot of this specific type of example of a deployment. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is really prime for um, you know SD WAN type deployments mm -hmm. where you you know the SD WAN capability is great, but the second that WAN connection gets cut for whatever yeah. reason, you know, uh, having that having having a virtual remote hands like capability like that it, it is definitely a key thing. It's it's something we have uh, within my internal organization I've struggled with. Um, you know, how do how do we provide this capability? Do you have out of band management uh, that's useful? Um, you know, particularly in type of deployments with SD WAN type uh, you know, right. products, and that's actually something that's that it's a small component for us, but it is a component that actually has prevented us from from moving forward with mm. SD WAN in, in some instances. It, so, so typically, what what we find it's a small component, which a lot of customers don't necessarily think about it, but it's exactly the one which stops you dead yes. on your track. Exactly. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then it's so uh, to to finish off that part uh, because I really want to move on um, is just here in terms of connectivity. Just think about if you have any form of management interface, be it serial, standard, some form of uh, sensor. SSH, Telnet, IPMI, whatever it might be, we can facilitate that management connectivity, and we act always as a local, um, as a local host, as um, in, in that branch office to you, and then we pass that traffic on to you. Um, probably the last uh, key uh, part here is because I ran into that with, uh, in our own environment is uh, because we act like a terminal server there is typically no need for you, uh, for example, to install Java or any other older form of SSH or anything like it locally on your laptop. We take all that pain away. We isolate it, we isolate it on the site. So if, um, if some form of web uh, UI still requires a Java plugin or something like it, we would run the Java plugin and you would just get an HTML5 um, screen uh, more of uh, what, what is happening. 
So we are going to come back to the device in the second part of the demo. For right now, I just want to show you a little bit more on, uh, on the cloud side. So that was the whole access and control part. Uh, let's move on to the management side of it. Under devices, you find all the devices which are involved to your uh, personal cloud instance. We have here a couple of different devices. The one device which we're currently looking, uh, looking at is the New York board, board is R. So by highlighting the device, you can now do multiple actions. You can apply a configuration. We're going to do that really more in depth in the second part of the, um, of the demo. But what you can do here as a, as a configuration, that can be a simple configuration file, which is a CLI based uh, file, or can be your own script or can be a script coming from one of our apps or anything like it. And the script can be anything from a bash, Python, Ruby, whatever you might have, uh, whatever your flavor of scripting language might be, you can, you can use it and then push it down to the device. A um, couple of other things which you can do, as we mentioned that before, software upgrade is directly available from here. You would just select your software version and push that down to the device. And um, actually, the one thing which I really want to show you is the backup. So like with most other solutions, you can create backups of the, of the devices. When you here uh, select backup, you have two uh, main questions to ask. Number one, what kind of file protection do you want? You can either choose none, then it's a normal file-based backup, or you can choose TPN encryption or password encryption. TPN encryption means the backup, when it's created locally on the device, gets encrypted by the local TPM and then uploaded to our cloud, meaning nobody's going to have access to it unless they have access to that TPM. So meaning the backup is really linked to that one device. Or a password that is in a more generic, you would set a password on the device and same thing would apply. Backup is created, gets encrypted with that local password, which you have to find upfront and then that gets uploaded right. to the cloud. So you have TPM built in on box? All of them. On those? All, of, all of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then to just say that, I mean, a lot of people say they have TPM, but they don't even use it. Right. right? So this is TPM. What I'm impressed with personally is this is TPM done right. Right. right? Uh, it, the, the reason I'm, I'm kind of stopping and harping on that for a second is because I, uh, the organization I work for, we work in the federal space. Hmm. So uh, federal and DOD. So that's, that's having that capability to mm -hmm. do that encryption on box and then transmit it. That's, that is actually pretty powerful uh, to sure. see. And I, I don't know of any other product out there right now that, that is actually doing that yeah, right. and, at least and not if, from an out of, out of band perspective. And if, if we dive in a little bit more right, on the security aspects of the box at the edge, right, we have 15, 20 plus different features right, from the TPM that I use to encrypt the disk. So all our boxes are shipped with um, hardware encrypted disks, right? Uh, with the self-signed OS, uh, with TPM, or with um, uh, geofencing, with the, so many right, of the, the features that you expect from a hardened uh, edge file platform, right? So it's, and we can cover this in another, in another discussion, but yes, right, um, TPM is there, right? Um, um, BIOS in, encryption, BIOS protection, um, BIOS protection uh, password via the OS. So there's a couple of patterns uh, there right, uh, that we have uh, deployed and we have developed uh, in our boxes. Yeah. So, um, and then the last question really is, uh, how do you want to store temporary or persistent? Temporary is you have um, if rolling backup. So you, we are keeping five and then um, if if backup number six is created, essentially then the first one gets overwritten or persistent means you, we are going to keep that backup until you manually delete it. So I'm going to start that off. Uh, we are going to come a little bit back. Uh, no, let me do that. We're going to come back in a short while to it. Um, essentially that process is now started. It gets pushed down to the device um, and you can see the operational statuses under profiles. Profiles really allows you to upload your own configurations, your own scripts, your own templates, um, everything what, what, we, uh, what we can use for management can be done here. And then under operations, you see as well the current operational statuses. Um, so for here, you can see the backup just got started. 
and it's currently running on the device. So we will come back in two or three minutes and then you can see that it's finished. Um, let me now move on to the apps. I just want to highlight really two apps here. One is a data lake. We're going to drill down to that in a second. The second one is an extended storage. The extended storage is a cloud-based storage. But what is important about that one is that it is available to all of your appliances. So you can use it to upload centrally, let's say a firmware file, which you will need to deploy to all of your different uh, branches or anything like it. You upload it to our uh, extended storage and then it's directly available to all the node grids deployed in each site. You can directly download locally from there and then uh, make it available um, to, to your end devices. The data lake. Yeah, just a minute. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, on the extended storage, right? Uh, for example, if you want to stage uh, deployment, an API date on a server and on uh, the OS on a server, you can stage by deploying right, uh, that file through the extended storage, right? And, uh, and your uh, sites will see the, the file and then you can then uh, push to the, to the local devices. We're going to see that hopefully in the second part of the demo as well. <laughs> Now, uh, Data Lake briefly explained how does Data Lake work. We have multiple plugins, which I would call probes, and those probes are getting pushed down or are run locally on the end device. In our case, the board is R. We have a wide variety of different pro uh, probes, starting from system-specific probes, which tell you like CPU utilization, memory utilization, over to, to curl, um, requests like this one. Let me just briefly take a look. Where is the one which I wanted to show you? Okay, let me go so into search box. Help I'm, just, I'm just going to clone it. Um, so essentially all of the default ones which we ship with ZP Cloud, you can't directly change them, but you can clone them and then you can adjust them to your own needs. Really what we want to, what I want to point out here with the curl one is how easy it is to just change the parameter. You can use that to monitor any of your applications, which maybe the local users are using, like Office 365, Zoom, uh, AWS, whatever instance you might have. So th then essentially, we would run a local probe on the board, would regular in, uh, interact with that service, and then you can use the ZP Cloud to analyze uh, to see what what is the traffic is. Is there any changes in the in the latencies, jitter, or uh, anything else? So there are, multi, uh, there are many different plugins there, many different probes which we, which can deploy, which cover our entire management portfolio, starting from sensors going to uh, to network connectivity options. When you're doing these, like uh, a curl probe, for example, um, if where is it sending that? probe is it going out of the outer band connection back out to the internet so via the lte or however it's connected correct it would use the primary interface typically uh, some of the probes directly uh, you can define which interface to use but in general it would use a primary connection with wood um, if if we want to come back briefly to our drawing typically the primary connection would be out your sd wan solution or whatever okay yeah, that, that's, that's where I was going, was it didn't seem very yeah. fruitful to monitor the performance of your outer band network. Um, and, and, and this is quite interesting. For example, if you, are, you have a retail and they are using uh, the point of sales through an uh, iPad and the iPad is talking to a cloud application and uh, you want to monitor that connectivity from the point of view of the store, to that cloud application, right? Uh, this probe will be checking that, telling you even before someone notifies that uh, there's some performance issues, right? So then lastly, you would take all of the different probes which you have, create a profile from it, and then you can assign that profile to your devices. So that is how you can get different probes, package them all together and have them uh, deployed. Now then to finish off that part, um, so then in our data lake, you can now, as you can see, we're using Elastic um, or the Elk stack. You can visualize, um, you can directly access the, the raw data if you wanted to. You can visual, create your own visualizations. We provide out of the box a couple of visualizations. We provide out of the box a couple of dashboards. And to finish the whole thing off, let me just show you one dashboard which I've created. Uh, specifically here for the for the demo. 
So as you can see, there are multiple plugins. Uh, first one, I've and connectivity-based ones. This is, for example, uh, one of the curl examples where it gives you a heat map, what is the response time to a specific site, um, how much traffic goes out, my primary interface, my LT interface, what are my latencies. But you can, as I mentioned before, you can get system information like CPU load, disk utilization, how many users are logged in, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, you can get environmental details as well down here. Let me, let me increase it briefly. Okay, are these able to then generate alerts around as we're kind of crossing into Correct. the network management side of this kind of stealth network performance monitoring here? Um, uh, so, so I, I yeah, just, I just, well, that, that was the last thing which I wanted to mention. Yes. So then, as soon as you have the data, you can you can create alarms and everything directly from here as well. Um, I mean, Elastic directly has the requirement uh, or the required tools here for alerting, setup alerting, setup alarms. So if an environment sensor reaches a, a specific threshold, you can get in, you can get an alert. If any of your probes reach any form of criteria, you can get an alert. And so in reality, and then, you can do complex event processing here with alerting, right? So that's yeah. that's like the, the cool part of it. The data lake becomes a repository of multiple types of data, right? Uh, from logs to event, uh, environmental, uh, to applications, uh, to security. And uh, you, can, you can now, uh, with that data, right, uh, create your own um, set of rules, right, and create that complex event processing with alerting. Right, and you, and you had some integrations. I think I think we saw ServiceNow was one of them earlier, and can I guess you can use those to, to you know, to trigger a ticket. So we direct uh, in our CP Cloud as of today, we have no direct integrations with ServiceNow, but we have APIs, uh, we have RESTful APIs, which you can directly use to uh, to pull information from our cloud. Our alerts and events can trigger uh, certain parts on in your for, in your own automation, which then can interact with ServiceNow or any other uh, provider. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out where the alerts went, other than I've raised an alarm, but then it's sitting in the cloud with no one looking at it kind of thing. So it's like, okay, where's, but, where's it pushing that to? So by default, it goes out to, to the cloud and then uh, probably as well via email, or you can have it sent to a specific um, event uh, monitoring system. So I noticed in the original slide, you were talking about sensors that you could add on to it. What's, I guess, what's built into the box and what can the sensors, as I'm assuming are add-ons, what can they do? So built in, you have a standard temperature, temperature sensor essentially based on the board in itself. So that's directly built in. And then you have a couple of standard um, sensors, which you would expect today with any modern hardware, I would say. The additional sensors, we really have a wide range of sensors, temperature, humidity, airflow, smoke, uh, leak detection, we have the alarms, uh, we have standard GPIOs, which you can use to expand uh, with, with your own sensors if you wanted to. Um, I mean, they, 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 there's a wide variety there and uh, we can typically cater to whatever the customer needs as well if they have any specific questions. The beauty of uh, the sensors, they, they are all USB based, right? Uh, so, uh, they, they can be plugged on the USB of the device, or you can get an extension uh, to expand the number of USBs and then uh, use the sensors that we integrate right, uh, with our system uh, to then um, monitor the environment um, in, the, in the site, right, in the remote location. 